afternoon. Uh, Thank you for that warm introduction. Um, it would be great pleasure to be present here today in Kochi and to be speaking to those with us here in the room as well as, well as those joining online. I'm really honored to present um, this keynote at the 61st Annual All India Occupational Therapy Conference and particularly filled with gratitude to the scientific and organizing committee and the um, executive committee of the um, All India Occupational Therapy Association for this opportunity. When looking at the theme of the Congress, I was particularly intrigued by the reference to magic as it conjured up connections with mystical and spiritual tenets that enhance how we see ourselves and importantly, how, our, how we bring our voices to the world, not just as occupational therapists, but as people who connect with the people that we work with. In this lecture, I will offer critical reflections on occupational science and how this moves us towards making magic. Magic, I suggest, contributes to more to a more just and equitable society. To begin, I want to acknowledge the essential elements of that the conference theme alerts us to. The theme suggests that occupational science can create magic in occupational therapy. It raises our curiosity about how occupations and occupations may be capable of promoting such magic. How it does this through promoting vibrance and possibilities of change. It opens up the opportunity for us to ask, what is this magic all about? Um, it asks us. It allows us to ask other questions, such as who is involved and what is necessary. Where and how does this happen? Adopting a critical perspective and asking questions in and about occupational science and its relationship with occupational therapy invites us to consider what are the optical illusions that may be part of this magic that we may need to become more conscious of. Critical theoretical perspectives in occupational science concentrate on revealing how human occupation relates to patterns of intergroup power relations that are produced through historical, socioeconomic, political, and cultural systems. These perspectives illuminate how such relations produce social privilege, inequity, and oppression, which negatively impact on, so, on specific social groups. Historically, these inequities have been overshadowed by viewpoints of human occupations which have created optical illusions. For example, occupational therapists have reduced categories of human occupation to work, self-care, and leisure, with much attention given to promoting performance within these areas. And this morning, during the, the um, discussions around assistive technology, we've seen and heard about the important impact that these focused um, interventions based on performance has on people's lives, how it is able to help them to re um, achieve some of their aspirations and some of these dreams. And so while that work is important alongside that, we need to think about what, what else is it that we need to consider. So in considering the what more it is that we need to look at, we need to recognize that occupational therapists sometimes tend to focus of the, on the optical illusion being produced within therapy. What might this optical illusion be, you might be wondering. 
And I'm suggesting that what we focus on is what people can do and how we can assist them within a therapeutic milieu to achieve their individual aspirations and dreams, giving little attention to the broader challenges that they may face in their everyday lives and their experiences, including experiences of overcoming marginalization. When we succumb to only focusing on this illusion of reality and limited to what we see in therapy and circumscribed by what we ask about, rather than being led by experiences of human occupation in context, we fool ourselves to believe that the optical illusion is full reality. The emphasis on performance, function, and independence through applying procedures that draw on narrow interpretations of scholarship as evidence diminishes the attention and value given to people's lived experience within context. In this way, we do not fully account for the, for the dynamics of human occupation in everyday life, particularly the realities of what people living in poverty and affected by social inequities confront. We obscure the possibilities of magic from happening. Our normative assumptions about human occupation as occupational therapists, especially working in clinical settings, have mainly been derived from the global north, meaning that human Eurocentric and biomedical perspective of being human and of health and well-being and be have dominated. For example, we adopted perspectives where we focus on the individual person and their environment, giving less attention to the interrelationship with those people sharing their environments with them with the influences of a culture on participation and importantly, how the social, economic and political systems that they are part of in their communities nationally and globally affects their participation in occupation. This creates boundaries of limitation in our thinking where we may focus only on the barriers or facilitators within an immediate environment that enables or prevents a person from performing their daily activities in their homes, at work, or during social or leisure activities. It obscures us from creating systemic change within context to shift participation and gives little consideration to how occupations may in themselves influence context over time. And one of the examples we saw in this morning's um, presentation was where the one speaker spoke about inviting a, um, a uh, one of the people he worked with was a university student to come and speak about his experience. And in actual fact, the student said, it's okay, I've already shared my experience at the university. And so there are such opportunities for us to look at how we might draw on what people are doing in their everyday lives and actually you, um, use the leverage we have to support the actions that they are taking in their lives. Parais and Laliberta, Radman, Laliberta Radman identified three discourses as limita limiting how participation in occupations is conceptualized. The first discourse is referred to as the individualization of social issues. And this describes the phenomenon where individuals are held responsible instead of recognizing the socio-political barriers limiting participation in occupations. For example, there may be a focus on an individual's capacity to learn rather than recognizing the limitations afforded in opportunities to access education within particular contexts. The second discourse highlights the over-reliance on, bio, bio, on a biomedical lens and healthism as a goal of occupational therapy practice. This foregrounds the body, emphasizing health as located within the physical body and perhaps even considering only the mental health aspects there are. But individual behavior is seen to be the cause and the solution to any of the health concerns. This discourse is preoccupied with how individuals take responsibility for stereotypical wellness activities. It's often a discourse that we see even in the way health 
systems might be organized. The third discourse is the growth of managerialism and maintaining our professional status as occupational therapists. Reproducing the discourse occurs in the way that occupational therapists continue to be pressured through neoliberal approaches to health management to comply with guidelines and protocols that control costs by simplifying complex transactional understandings of participation to matters of individual performance. Together, these discourses implicitly govern the pra our practice and constrain our subjectivity as practitioners. The illusion we tend to hold on to as occupational therapists is maintained by the dualistic perspective that place, ba that place value on sets of mutually exclusive, absolute sets of ideas. An optical illusion is magical, right? So what's the trick in this magic? The trick is produced by manipulating the, the way things are seen or perceived. What we think and see influences what we do as professionals and as scholars. That is, it shapes practice and research, it shapes our thinking and our doing which we can call praxis. We can challenge ourselves to engage with realities, such as the inequities in societies, by finding alternative ways of seeing that can be more grounded within critical perspectives of human occupation. These critical perspectives provide possibilities for moving beyond the limiting discourses which I've just described. I'd like to share this next video with you of artists producing optical illusions and invite you to consider the alternatives available to us. As you watch the video, notice your capacity to see multiple truths, the different perspectives in what emerges rather than only focusing on the outcome of the optical illusion. Unlike these optical illusions, using binary perspectives, we see truth in the world in linear ways usually. 
leading us to singular lines of reasoning, to view the truth behind ideas, knowledge, and ways of doing. It occludes us from seeing the myriad of possibilities for coexistence and pluralities. If we are to move towards creating magic, we have to begin to embrace these pluralities by recognizing a spectrum of truth and realities that bring voice to those spaces and people who may have been silenced previously. Embracing these perspectives requires shifts in how occupational therapy is practiced. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to conduct a research project that was part of a knowledge exchange between India, Brazil, and South Africa. And so with an esteemed colleague who you all know very well, Dr. Shovan Saha, we had the opportunity to um, learn from each other's practice across these different contexts. And following that um, engagement in 2016, together with colleagues from Manipal University and colleagues at the University of Cape Town, we published a book entitled Concepts in Occupational Therapy, Understanding Southern Perspective. This book, still available from Manipal University Press and used in curricula both in South Africa and internationally at um, universities in America and in uh, Europe, assist us with opening the necessary conversations into addressing pressing issues, including a need for us to take an anti-colonial stance that rejects violent settler colonialism that aims to claim the land and exterminate indigenous communities and populations by eradicating the, way, the ways of thinking and doing that have been integral to their lives. In one of the chapters in our book, we describe the occupation-based community development framework as a guideline for community development practice in occupational therapy. Rather than this framework being uh, thought about as a model for occupational therapy, it offers a tool for reasoning that can be used together with other frameworks and aims to be um, continued to be developed through the context in which it is applied. And so for us in South Africa, the practice and thinking about what this occupation-based community development framework needs to be has evolved over more than 20 years of scholarship with students and different communities and colleagues involved in developing the framework. And it's really informed our practice and curricula in, in, in these spaces. What I'd like to share with you now is a little bit of the backstory around how this, um, how some of the early elements of this framework was developed. So early in my career, I was concerned with the limitations of our practice of occupational therapy, which tended to pathologize youth from so low socioeconomic communities in Cape Town. I sought out the opportunity to work in an area of Cape Town called Lavender Hill. Lavender Hill came into existence during the apartheid era in South Africa, when colored people such as myself were forced, not that I was forcibly removed, but other colored people, were forcibly removed from areas designated for white people. This historical legacy remains evident as the area remains characterized by poverty and domestic violence today still. There are few opportunities for, or services for youth and gangsterism and drug abuse prevail. Many people living in Lavender Hill live in overcrowded situations and have poor access to health, and social services. Then census statistics indicate that there are high levels of unemployment, low income, and that low, there are low educational levels persisting in for the majority of people in Lavender Hill. And so the exit level of education for, me, for the majority is a primary school education and for some, a high school education. Historically in South Africa, Colored people were expected, even encouraged, to enter and remain in low-income, low-status um, jobs, serving industry's demands. Race and class were inherently linked under apartheid, 
and are still strongly associated in post-apartheid South Africa. With these concerns in mind, I began to conduct the research and also started to practice in Lavender Hill, developing what was to become known as this occupation-based community development framework. So what's interesting about this is that the practice came first. And so while working in Lavender Hill, we developed ways that was responding to the community. And only about, um, I think, 10 years later, we termed it occupation-based community development. At that, at early, in the early stages, I was intrigued to know more about the influences on youth occupational choices. It was apparent that the way that occupational choice, as it was characterized and theorized in occupational therapy, emphasized occupational choice as a mechanism for assimilating into existing social systems. So we would ask people about their goals, but expect them to remain in the spaces that they found themselves in and not necessarily looking at or considering that it might be our role to think about how they pursue opportunities beyond the limitations of the social conditions. The role of occupational choice thus for allowing individuals to fulfill social roles was foregrounded in occupational therapy and occupational science literature in a very limited way. In my engagement with marginalized youth as an occupational therapist, I noticed that most social roles available to them limited their possibilities for participation. It led me to question the relevance of existing theories for advancing social justice in our context. In my view, we needed to explore ways of promoting living where possibilities were not closed based on identities such as race and class. And so this was for me part of thinking beyond the optical illusion was thinking about what are the kinds of questions that needed to be asked to, in order to contribute to social change. It was also recognizing that the practice that I wanted to um, be a part of was not yet available in the kinds of occupational therapy that was being promoted within the profession. So through a continued efforts of research and practice, I developed contextually situated interpretations of occupational choice. And part of this was through my research, but it was also working with community members and getting their feedback, and also through the work of the many students who contributed to these projects. So rather than seeing the kinds of knowledge that um, was generated through this practice as being contextually bound and really just um, uh, right, for the context of Lavender Hill, using a decolonial attitude of valuing knowledges and people's experiences in the global South meant that I recognized that the youth and people in Lavender Hill had knowledge and experience that occupational therapy and occupational science globally could learn from. This attitude moves away from hierarchies of classification that divides people as either consumers or producers of knowledge. In fact, it embraces the idea that everyone has a role to play in knowledge production and that it is ours to work out how this might come to life. Being able to engage in critical reflexivity allowed us to build a justice orientation to research and practice. My conceptualization of occupational choice was informed by Baudier's interpretation of how the limiting parameters implicit in operant doctor within the particular fields that um, young people found themselves led to the acceptance of actions within a social field for groups and communities of people. I recognized that this occurred in, through practical consciousness expressed in individual and collective occupational choice. To put it simply, people did what intuitively they thought that the community and the social expectations were um, expecting from them with limited um, critical consciousness for thinking about how they could actually push for or push themselves for different ways of engaging in occupation. 
The most study reveals how social reproduction occurred through occupational choice, reflecting that youth's identities were powerfully influenced by the socio-cultural and historical political context in which they lived. Historicizing everyday life to reveal this recognizes that the social reproduction of occupational choice is not a reflection of individual motivation or ability, which is often where we stop as occupational therapists, is just thinking about the individual's motivation, their abilities, and some of the practical necessities that need to be thought about to put that in, into, into action. Instead, what we need to think about is, are these larger socio-cultural, historical, political factors that influence context? The occupational choice then emerged as serving social relationality rather than only individual pursuit of personal goals. Occupation-based community development practice emerged then at this point as a reasoning um, framework for practice. The framework acknowledges that promoting change has to raise consciousness about and sorry, has to range, raise consciousness about and contest the influence of dominating patterns of normativity on everyday doing and on occupational choice so that contextual conditions can be challenged. Shifts in mindset lead to collective opportunities for reflexivity, creating different possibilities and opportunities for conversations with the people we're working with, with communities, and eventually different opportunities and wider opportunities for participation. Generative disruption is one of the terms that we then need to think about engaging in. It's seen as a possible passage towards more equitable realities and occurs through finding new possibilities for doing by subverting, challenging and providing alternatives or resisting powers imposing coloniality in everyday acts. Generative disruption involves standing for ways of doing and being and creating possibilities outside colonial, heteropatriarchal, and white supremacist landscape. It necessitates seeing the continuum and fuller spectrum for the production of knowledges and practices and creates space for indigenous expression. The spectrum, this spectrum of knowledges and practices draws from, richness, draws from the richness of interconnections, dialogue, collaboration, interdependence, and compassion. It is about building bridges and linking people, faces and places, cross-fertilizing ideas, and inspiring imagination and innovative ways of seeking and consolidating the good life for all and sundry. Indeed, it invites us to begin to see the interconnections between knowledge we hold within a profession with the knowledge emanating from marginalized and silenced communities. It privileges the valuable insights that can be generated through collectives and allows us to build solidarity across struggle. Generative disruption in occupation-based community development adopts a standpoint of decolonial love, which offers the possibility of both troubling what is and moving towards more liberatory ways of being and doing. Occupation-based community development promotes actively participating and partnering with, collaborating with community members who are marginalized in context and learning from indigenous, cultural, intuitive, mystical and spiritual knowledges. It thus offers a way of reasoning in practice that enables practitioners to engage with and design solutions with communities, not just for them, and to respond to the injustices and inequities experienced. Nelson Maldonado Torres suggests that a decolonial practice of love embraces an ethic of a liberation of life through a decolonial attitude that seeks to transport, that seeks to create a transmodern world where many worlds fit. 
deep colonial lab invites the recognition of humanity and affinity across differences. And the, this affinity as humans, but it's also thinking about our profession and within our profession, how we build affinity across the different ways of practicing so that we can build a profession that's stronger and that can partner with communities. It's learning to appreciate plurality and multiplicity. In closing, I'd like to suggest that embodying and enacting decolonial love holds much potential for us as occupational therapists and occupational scientists. It brings places, experiences, ways of doing and being into conversation with one another. These conversations are forms of dialogue that are not competitive, but seeks to build understanding and turn together towards new ways of seeing, thinking, being, and doing. Such turning together, which is such turning together, allows experiences and influences with patriarchy, colonialism, and white supremacy that operate in the world to be explored, with a view to also identify how to manifest differently and how people respond in ways that open up pathways to liberation. Exploring these situations as guided by decolonial love to build mutual understanding is not to say that anything goes. Instead, it is a political love, one of accountability that involves confronting what it is to not reproduce the discourses and reinscribe forms of violence, such as those that I described earlier, but instead to hold ourselves and others accountable for creating otherwise ways of doing, thinking, and being. Decolonial love is a liberatory practice that builds a reparative and transformative future by bearing witness to past and present violence and supports an unraveling of coloniality. As a profession of occupational therapy, we should open ourselves to this magic and to use it to contribute to, more, to a more just and equitable world. Thank you. That was a wonderful keynote address by Professor Roshan Galvan. I request uh, President AIOTA, Dr. Anil K. Srivastava, sir, to felicitate our keynote speaker, who is come all the way from Cape Town. If you need any further clarification, as we do not uh, allow question answers for a keynote speaker, you can connect to her off the dais. Thank you.